On March 18, 1965, cosmonaut Alexei Leonov successfully completed a historic 12 minute and 9 second spacewalk in the emptiness above North Central Africa. The rest of his mission didn't go so smoothly. A cramped Voshkod spacecraft and overly inflated spacesuits caused a 46 second delay in reorienting the ship's center of gravity during its re-entry. This delay meant that Leonov and his comrade had to land almost 250 miles from the intended site, right in the middle of the vast Siberian wilderness. After his rescue from two freezing nights in the bare and wolf-infested forests with a broken heater and a 9mm pistol, Leonov would go on to lobby the Soviet space program for the creation of this, the TP-82 survival pistol a sawed-off, triple-barreled, shotgun, flare-gun, machete combination. Something to ensure that no cosmonaut landing in a frigid taiga would ever have to worry about a half-ton bear during mating season ever again. Cosmonauts reportedly carried these weapons into space and back for over 25 years. The idea of astronauts carrying guns into space is oddly compelling. It approaches our sci-fi vision of the future. A future filled with warships and jetpacks and ray guns, which the Soviets also developed, but never deployed, as a matter of fact. But given the realities of how objects move in space, should guns and other weapons, like those cosmonauts carried past the Kármán line for a quarter century, like those spacefarers of the future might carry and spaceships might shoot, should these be illegal? Now entering the facility. We are considering this question today because I recently had the great pleasure of interviewing a true sci-fi leviathan. I wanted to ask them what readers and watchers question the most in their critically acclaimed and award-winning sci-fi series. Of course, I'm talking about one half of James S. A. Corey, co-creator of The Expanse, a friend and fellow hair enthusiast, Ty Frank. Now, if you know me, you know I'm something of an Expanse evangelist. I've told most of you to go watch the show because I think it's the best show on TV right now, and it's certainly one of the best sci-fi stories of this generation. And with the final season of the show airing right now, with the final book in the nine-part series out now, Leviathan Falls, I thought it'd be a great time to ask Ty what readers and watchers question in this possibly most scientifically accurate of stories ever. Apparently, many readers and watchers have a problem with the possible unintended consequences of firing bullets, projectiles, and railguns in space. Why are they so concerned? Well, I could go through all of the physics and all the no drag and all that in space, or I could let my favorite video game speech of all time, one of them, do it for me. Sir Isaac Newton is the deadliest son of a bitch in space. Now, serviceman Burnside, what is Newton's first law? Sir, an object in motion stays in motion, sir. No credit for partial answers, maggot. Sir, unless acted on by an outside force, sir. Damn straight! I dare to assume you ignorant jackasses know that space is empty. Once you fire this hunk of metal, it keeps going till it hits something. That can be a ship, or the planet behind that ship. It might go off into deep space and hit somebody else in 10,000 years. If you pull the trigger on this, you are ruining someone's day, somewhere and sometime. That is why you check your damn targets. That is why you wait for the computer to give you a damn firing solution. That is why, serviceman Chung, we do not eyeball it. This is a weapon of mass destruction. You are not a cowboy shooting from the hip. Sir, yes, sir! Ah, Pizza Chef. A true hard sci-fi classic speech. Now, everything that NPC just said is scientifically accurate, except that character is implicitly assuming that any rogue projectile will definitely hit something eventually. Now, if that were indeed always the case, you could see it posing a big legality issue. Do you know how much trouble we go through just to make sure we can't be held accountable for destroying possible microbes on a possible planet possibly somewhere sometime? Yeah, well now imagine all the hoops you'd have to legally jump through to ensure that you don't hit someone in the face with a projectile with a nuclear bomb's worth of energy behind it. Yeah, that would 
I don't want to be held accountable for that. But we must now question the NPC's logic. Will a rogue projectile randomly fired off into the void in the absence of gravity and air resistance always hit something eventually? Is that true? Well, Ty Frank's ship has initiated a deceleration burn. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, just let Ty know that I'll be aboard the Rossi in just a minute. And that I'm keeping his cool plexiglass space phone until he puts me in one of his stories and or shows. Tell him that. Tell him. I'd like to quickly point out that the terrestrial version of today's question already has an answer. In most places on Earth, it is currently illegal to in a celebratory way or recklessly fire a gun into the sky. The reason, of course, is simple. These bullets traveling through the sky under the influence of gravity and air resistance will eventually fall back down to Earth. And when they do, they often hit someone or something. I've even seen studies from hospitals indicating that these falling bullets could in fact be more deadly than your typical gunshot wound because they are much more likely falling out of the sky to hit someone in the head. The important variable here seems to be the density of potential targets in some volume. Is it likely that as a bullet travels some distance, it will hit something in the volume that it is traveling? For example, think about the difference between firing into a crowded downtown area's sky, which sounds very legally, you should be held accountable for that, versus firing into the sky of the Siberian wilderness. That seems not as bad, right? Well, returning to our question, if humanity ever does return to space in a colonizing fashion like The Expanse imagines, will firing a bullet recklessly or missing your target as Mass Effect outlines be like firing into a crowded downtown sky or will it be as inconsequential as another snowflake in Siberia? Hmm, Arya, send a tight beam to Ty. Let them know that I'm boarding the Rossi soon and that the Rossi and the space phone are totally real and that I'm keeping both of them. Bye-bye. This video has been sponsored by Keeps. Hey guys, are you worried about losing your hair? Do you want to treat your male pattern baldness online and at home in the safety of your own home which you are at? Okay, then you gotta try Keeps. Keeps is a subscription service that focuses on making it easier and more affordable than ever for men to treat their male pattern baldness online and at home where again, they are, you are. Hey there gamers, I'm award-winning science educator and anthropomorphized Chewbacca, Kyle Hill. You know, when I'm not sciencing, I'm thinking about the best way to keep my luscious locks or else I will literally walk into the ocean and never come back. Did you know? that 66.6% .6 repeating of men under the age of 35 will experience some form of male pattern baldness. Knock, knock, who's there? No. Try keeps. You have to keep it. <laughs> Get FDA approved medications delivered right to your door. Get treated at home. Talk with your own doctor consultant 24 <laughs> seven. What else do I need, Kyle? I'll tell you what, five star ratings. Don't worry, keeps has all of them. More than the other ones. <laughs> Keep stop chasing me. Gentlemen, if you're ready to take treating hair loss seriously, if you want to discover what hundreds of thousands of men already know, go to keeps.com slash Kyle Hill to get 50% off your first order. <laughs> yeah, that's right. All you have to do is use my name. That's keeps.com slash Kyle Hill. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, what's that? Oh, it's not for me? It's for them? It's for you, it's Keeps. Hi, Frank. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Congratulations on the premiere of the final season of The Expanse, uh, number two on the New York Times bestseller list for Leviathan Falls. Thank you for being here. And um, I thought it would be interesting to try to figure out in real time, what's the likelihood that an errant bullet or errant projectile fire from something like the Rosinante or, or what have you, what are the actual chances that it would go on forever and hit something? Even if it would stop in what we calculated before, but what are the actual chances it would hit something? And 
I wanted to try to calculate this with your input using something called the mean free path. And this is something that's used in uh, particle physics, but basically it's how much stuff is in some volume and how quickly do you travel through that volume and how big are you? That should give you some indication of how far you can go on average before you hit something, you know? And my criteria for this, and we can, we can uh, adjust this to your specifications, but my criteria for this was if a random projectile that misses can go farther than the galaxy or farther than the solar system without hitting anything, then it'd be very unlikely that it would be illegal even in a very uh, more advanced civilization like is portrayed in the expanse. Does that make sense to you? It it does, yeah. And um, I, I'm very excited by you doing this video because every time somebody says, why are they just shooting their PDCs? Wouldn't they all hit something? I'm just going to link them your video from now on. That's so you're doing me a huge service here. You're helping me out. <laughs> It's perfect. Uh, <laughs> yeah, th this all this all takes place canonically right before I die off screen. If you were writing a story where this was consequential, what would your cross section of impact be? Now, by that, I mean, what are you worried about hitting if someone was coming to you and saying, yeah. like, OK, well, what would be the real issue? Well, the, the, the first thing you're worried about hitting is another ship mm -hmm. that you don't intend to that. Um, if if the bullets are, that are fired do not achieve, you know, solar escape velocity, that means they're going to settle into an orbit, right? And they're just going to orbit the sun for the next, you know, however long. Mm -hmm. um, and if some hapless ship should wander through that orbit, now you've got this, this bullet whipping around the solar <laughs> system that's just going to go right through your ship. Yes. Um, I think less worrisome is planets because... Uh, these objects are small enough that even at the speeds they're traveling, if they hit an atmosphere, sure, they're gonna they're gonna burn up. And and one of the things that's true in the show is that Mars' atmosphere is getting thicker and thicker as they go through their ah terraforming as yeah as they go through their terraforming project. Um, now there are plenty of places that have settlements like Luna, where there's big domes and people live under those domes, and there is no atmosphere. So obviously, a you know two kilogram uh, railgun slug slamming down <laughs> through the dome of your <laughs> of your lunar habitat's probably not good. No, I want that. But I think I think more than anything else, what people think about is is ships. Okay, you know, if you're just flying your ship around, are you just going to run into random bullets that were fired twelve years ago in some <laughs> previous war? Yeah. Okay. Well, I will say that when you're considering the cross section here, the smaller it is, obviously, the less likely it is it's going to get hit. Right. Just in general. Usually when uh, I was calculating this kind of thing, I started with like star sized objects and then worked my way down to see how right. uh, long it would take. Now, I think a good middle ground between something like accidentally hitting a star sized object, which sounds likely, and a ship sized object is maybe like a planet sized target. I mean, if you're talking about things going into orbit or, or you don't even want to get anywhere near some of these locations, right? right? I think I think a couple thousand, you know, KM in radius all around seems pretty safe to me, right? Sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, say something the size of like Ganymede. Oh, right? yes. Um, which has no atmosphere is covered with people living under domes uh -huh. and uh, would have a very bad day if a bunch of you know, rail guns rounds were raining down on them. <laughs> okay, so Ganymede has a radius of two and a half thousand kilometers, which I think puts it like half of Earth's radius. So it's about half of the radius of Earth. So what then I would do is I would try to roughly estimate, very, very roughly, how many Ganymede-sized things are in, say, the galaxy. <laughs> Galactic, I, I'm trying to give this the best 
chance of of making your fans point. <laughs> right. So you're, we're talking about bullets that have achieved solar escape velocity and are hurtling off through the galaxy with the maximum number of chances to run into something. I'm th I'm thinking like the worst case scenario, and if and if the worst case scenario, the free mean path gives you a distance, right? So if if the worst case scenario gives you you know, just a few thousand kilometers or, or something like that, a, a distance that a normal ship would be traveling in the expanse or something like that on a, on a run. If the average randomly fired bullet or missed bullet is going to hit something every 10,000 kilometers, 1 million kilometers, something like that, that's bad right? Yeah. <laughs> because you have a lot of things traveling those distances within that volume. And that would be bad, especially if you're firing hundreds, if not thousands of rounds, right? There are a lot of planets in the galaxy. <laughs> there's a there's a hundred billion planets in the galaxy. But the, the galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy is obviously quite big and voluminous right? Eight trillion cubic light years. <laughs> and if, if you know your orders of magnitude, which I'm sure you do, you, you already have a, a, a tingle in your head. They're like, okay, a hundred billion versus eight trillion cubed. I don't, I don't know <laughs> if that's going to be exactly uh, very dense with stuff. So if I put the Ganymede radius thing how many of those Ganymede radius things are inside of a volume? How long, on average, would something have to travel before hitting something like that? And if I put that in, <laughs> I get 3.3 times 10 to the 20 light years. <laughs> is, is that a lot? Is that a big number? Well, using Wolfram Alpha here, not a sponsor, to do all the uh, conversions, I could, I could divide all that by the uh, diameter of the universe. Wow. So it's something like, you know, uh, 600 million, by which I mean the average distance that something that size could travel before it hit something is 600 million times longer than the universe is wide. <laughs> so it could make 300 million trips. A randomly fired projectile could make the equivalent of 300 million trips across the universe or across, uh, well, across this galaxy i'm kind of mixing up values here but yeah. if the whole universe had the density of planets that the milky way does you could travel across it millions of times without hitting anything ever and now, that but there's there's some there's some caveats there right because yes. that is not including things like um gravity wells tending to pull objects toward things mm -hmm. right that's that sort of leaves that out of the equation i would guess um the question the that doesn't surprise me because i i read my douglas adams and in in douglas adams uh 13 4 in the holy script it says space is big space is quite really big. really big and uh so you know like Whenever people talk about things randomly happening in space, my first answer is always to quote from the, the Holy Scripture of Douglas Adams. Say, yeah. It's so much bigger than you think it is. So much. And that's kind of what I want to get at with this whole discussion. You know, just just the title, The Expanse. I don't think people really grasp the enormity of it, right? I mean, even if I bump up the size of objects here that you don't want to hit, Basically, I'm just making the targets bigger to the size of the sun. It could still travel across the entire universe 150,000 times yeah. bef before hitting anything. Now, the gravity well thing is uber complicated. There, uh, there's yeah, probably no, there's, and there's no way to include. There's it. probably not an average thing, but yeah. what I would say 
it seems contextual, right? Where I could see that if in a, in a vacuum, <laughs> in a vacuum, um, if you pick a truly random direction in space, your chances of hitting a planet or getting near a planet are similarly minuscule. But in something like the Expanse, if you are fighting near and around planets and you're almost always in that vicinity, then being captured by orbit seems very likely, right? And I think, I think that's... I, I think the question, the answer to the question the fans are asking mm. is if you bring this down to just the volume of our solar system and you take objects that will never achieve solar escape velocity, so they will settle into an orbit yeah. in our solar system, how long can they just orbit around the sun in our solar system and never hit a ship-sized object? It gets complicated in that now you have, like, instead of a general volume of, of stuff, you have, like, a some corridor, right? Some, like, some, some like, tube. If they're, yes. if they're moving through around a radius or around a circumference, now you have what stuff are in that circumference. But if the other things are moving at a similar speed as everything else... Right. Right? I mean, if, uh, if the ships are... If they want to, say, uh, uh, land near one of the outer planets or whatever, um, you're going to need to match these orbital velocities anyway. That's right. And then the relative velocity between you and one of these projectiles could be quite low, you know? Yes. Um, it'd be like rendezvousing with another ship. So it gets... <laughs> Obviously, this gets as complicated as we want, but I think, I think that the takeaway is that space is so unbelievably large that to get it to like a, a should firing weapons in this way like the expanse does for example should it be illegal i think i think the the colonization or the just the how many ships and bullets and things you would have to have firing all the time forever it just seems not very likely to me that that was our uh, sort of back of the napkin yeah. guess that it's very, very, very unlikely. But uh, Daniel and I are notoriously bad at math. <laughs> so that's why that's why we needed to bring in an expert like yourself to look at this. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the reality is I think most, like, most rounds are not going to achieve solar escape velocity. They're not fast enough. No. Um, so they are going to settle into an orbit somewhere, um, you know, which will depend on the speed they were traveling and the angle and all that, where where their orbit winds up. Yeah. Or they, I mean, they um, could be flung out of the solar system for. All, I mean, even if they're not achieving escape velocity, yeah. they they could be on one of these unstable orbits. They just get slingshot somewhere else, and it's, you know, right. Or if they're going fast enough, the orbit they wind up at could be quite a ways outside a high traffic area, for sure. Probably every single one of these orbits, even if it gets captured around a planet or whatever, in the best case, are going to be decaying orbits. And they're going to tumble into the atmosphere and never hit a ship ever anyway, right? I mean, right. without any controlling burns or whatever, like... Uh, lifting up the the belter ship on illus to make sure it's not decaying into the atmosphere or something like that bullets don't have that kind of assistance right so oh thank you so much for helping me uh go through some of this and answering questions and bringing up even more questions than i ever thought about um it's 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 um it's too late for me to 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 be in in season six right it is too late, but I, uh, I'll, let me tell uh, you this. When okay. you finally write your sci-fi story yeah. or your sci-fi book with all of your rigor and calculations in it, um, I will totally uh, option that story and turn it into something. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Long hair, unite! I love it. Thank you, Ty, so much for your time. Congratulations on the best-selling book, the last season of my favorite show on television. I hope to talk to you soon. Thanks, man. Bye-bye. Now exiting the facility. 
Thank you so much to the very nerdy staff at the facility for the direct and substantial support in the creation of this here video. Today, especially, I want to recognize research assistant Gary Verda and visiting scholar Dominique Giambattista. If you want to join the facility, if you want to drape on a silky white lab coat, talk to me every day on Discord, get behind the scenes photos and videos, see episodes early, you can go to patreon.com slash Kyle Hill and join the facility today. And hey, if you support us just enough, get your name at the end on Aria here in every single video. <laughs> There's so many of you. How am I going to pass the time while you look at all of your names? Well, as I was saying about joining the facility, if you join today, you can see the entire conversation that I had with Ty Frank. We had a full 45 minutes before I even started recording for this episode of The Facility where we go through an entirely different question and do all of the math in real time aboard a gosh dang spaceship. If you want to see that, patreon.com slash Kyle Join it. Or else. Thanks for watching. Join it or else.